Could the blood of the fishermen of Tyre carry evidence that might help repair the wounds of war? Do their faces reflect in some fleeting way the faces of the Phoenicians from long ago? Though it may be hard to see in these eyes, even 3,000 years ago, religious controversy swirled around the Phoenicians. The Old Testament tells the story of one of Tyre's most infamous daughters, Jezebel. The quintessentially shameless woman was, in fact, a Phoenician princess. Jezebel was married to Ahab, a king of Israel. She seduced him and his followers into praying to her gods, the idols of Phoenicia. I think that she did, in fact, get a bad rap because what she was doing was importing all of the kinds of religious practices that she grew up with as a princess of ancient Tyre. And it was natural for her to bring those things with her when she became the queen of ancient Samaria. Jezebel's rise to power and the threat she posed to the prophets of Israel led to her demise. In the end, she died violently pushed out a window by her own servants. Her brutal legacy cast a grave shadow over the ancient Phoenicians. In the Old Testament, they're maligned as idol worshippers. Other ancient texts refer to them as cheaters and hucksters, the bad boys of the ancient world. The Phoenicians were very wealthy and very powerful, and this caused tremendous envy and jealousy in the kingdom of Israel. The Phoenicians get very negative reporting in the Hebrew Bible. They constantly write about the luxury and wealth and beauty of ancient cities like Tyre and Sidon, but at the same time, they're constantly talking about how they're sink beds of corruption and filth and squalor. So perhaps the root of all the bad press was envy. Their rivals could not compete with the rulers of the seas. Remarkable ships of those rulers is what explorer Robert Ballard seeks. For Ballard, excavating a Phoenician hull would be the closest he could ever come to meeting them. Between Phoenicia and Sicily. In many ways, we're following the same trade routes the Phoenicians follow. Westward bound. Ballard has also mastered the Mediterranean, the sea once considered the middle of the earth. His discoveries employing state of the art technology and gut instincts have made him one of the most prominent explorers of our times. The Phoenicians are the true ancient mariner. They didn't have a giant nation, a great army, vast natural resources and wealth. They had to survive on their cunning and their mastery of the sea. Look at the uh, crescent. I am a person of the sea. I have a connection to them. I'm somewhat of a, a rogue as well. I have great respect for them, so I want to find them. June 11th, 1999, Ballard has found the Phoenicians. Joined by Harvard archaeologist Larry Steger, the explorer is positioned above a site near the coastal border of Egypt and Israel. There's something coming in, but it's to the right here. Oh, yeah. There's something there. The find is astounding. That's got to be the big one. Oh, that's the mother load. <laughs> the mother of all ships. We were coming in. I wasn't looking at the wreck. I was looking at Larry's face. I came in and I saw his face just glow. And he said, the Phoenician. There she blows. It was the oldest shipwreck ever found in the deep. its cargo of amphora jars stacked on a deck that now rests 1,200 feet down. This is the first Iron Age ship that's All ever right. been found in the All right. All right. Yeah. But the real revelation is the ship's location roughly 30 miles from shore, proof that the ancient Phoenicians left the safety of the coast and struck out across the open sea. Look at those other pods. Look at those other pods. You didn't see those in the... Look at that. 
There's the anchor, yes. Up to the upper right. As a seaman and entrepreneur, Ballard could put himself into the mind of the ancient mariner. If you think about the ancient mariner, time was money, particularly for a Phoenician, and they didn't want to waste time. I think that they wanted to go the quickest, fastest way to anywhere. Five years later, Ballard plans to return to this site, but he has no idea how difficult it will be to find the Phoenicians once more. Across the Mediterranean, another quest to unlock the secrets of the Phoenicians is unfolding at what was once the edge of their known world, Gibraltar. At the point where Africa and Europe nearly touch, the legendary rock juts from the sea, an unmistakable gateway. The Phoenicians undoubtedly crossed this threshold, but what did it take to traverse a portal into the unknown? Answers are coming to light in a cave at the base of the rock. Here, archaeologists have to earn their knowledge. The entrance to Gorham's cave is some 350 steep steps down the crumbling face of the rock. Spanish archaeologist Paco Giles helps lead the team. We're at a very, very wild place, and it's complicated to get to the cave. A lot of rocks have fallen from the top of the Rock of Gibraltar, and both the going up and going down are dangerous. But for Giles, the risks are a fair price to pay. Over the years, they've found more than 5,000 artifacts in the cave. But they are not what might be expected. Here, we don't have kitchen stuff or items for daily use. What we have are very small items that, in spiritual terms, are very large. Hiles' team has discovered what seem to be personal talismans, charms, rings, scarabs, finely crafted glass vases. Even though they are very tiny items, we can reconstruct through them the moment, the key moment of the Phoenician's visit. Hiles believes the Phoenicians were performing some kind of ritual here. But until the excavation is completed, its precise nature will remain unknown. While there are many Phoenician sites in the Mediterranean, virtually no written evidence has ever been excavated. In fact, not a single original Phoenician manuscript has survived, leaving them mute and defenseless throughout the millennia. The Phoenicians had the unlucky fate of sharing the Mediterranean with two jealous foes, the ancient Greeks from 1200 BC and the ancient Romans from 300 BC. Much of what we do know of their rites and rituals comes from the damning words of these rivals. The Greek historian Herodotus described a ritual, a kind of institutionalized one-night stand, much like what happened in Phoenicia. Every woman must sit in the temple and associate, once in her life, with a strange man. When she has given herself, she has fulfilled her duty to the goddess and returns home. I think from these people we get a very skewed look at the Phoenicians. The kind of religion that they were practicing was not so different from religion as practiced by so many peoples in the ancient Levant. Perhaps a more accurate but still confounding history is portrayed in their sculpture. The consummate salesman Phoenicians reveal a chameleon-like nature, mimicking the taste of their clients. The Egyptians, the Persians, the Israelites. Though they may appear disingenuous, 
One discovery at the Temple of Eshman reveals a more sincere Phoenician. Phoenicians with sick children came to this holy site south of Beirut to ask Eshman, their god of healing, for help.